to solve it. Thank you very much. That concludes that debate, and I'm going to move swiftly on to the next debate, because I can see that everybody is in their front bench places. So I'll call uh, the next item of business. There's a debate on motion 16710 in the name of Brian Whittle on health education. And I'd invite those members who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Brian Whittle to speak to and move the motion. If I can have a wee bit of quiet. Eight minutes, please, Mr. Whittle. Um, thank you, presiding officer, and I am delighted, as Andy Moon and about me ensues, I am delighted to have the opportunity to open this debate on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives, and I now move the motion in my name. I can also thank all the organisations who sent in briefing documents. And I, I was struck, presiding officer, with the opening sentence in the briefing submitted by the Scottish Food Coalition, which reads, our food environment promotes and normalises unhealthy diets. However, it has to be noted that our farmers produce the highest quality food. They are charged with the custodianship of the countryside, pay at least a living wage, and ensure the highest animal welfare standards. Yet when it comes to public food procurement, we find that a high proportion of the food in our schools and hospitals, much of which could be sourced locally, comes from cheaper imports. I've said before in this chamber that only 16% of the Excel procurement contracted food is sourced from our own food grown by Scottish farmers. Now the, uh, I'll take a brief intermission. Yeah. Monica Lennon. I'm grateful to Brian with so the member mentioned food in our hospitals and in schools. I wonder what his view is on processed meats being served in both those locations that contain nitrites. Does he believe that we should, we should see a shift to um, nitro-free meats in our, our schools and hospitals? Brian Whittle. I thank Monica Lennon for that intervention. Actually, if we followed the, the, the path that I'm trying to get here is, is, is procuring food as locally sourced to the school as possible, that, that particular problem, would, I think, would be solved in one fell swoop. And I think the government can't be satisfied with the lack of support for, the food, uh, for our food producers. And it contrasts uh, with the gold standard in East Ayrshire, where nearly 75% of ingredients for school meals are sourced locally. So there can be no excuse so, Deputy Secretary Officer, we will be supporting the government's amendment, but in doing so, noting that their amendment is rather high on the platitudes and light on actual positive action. It's not enough to note that schools are a place of education. That's hardly a revelation. What we need to do is afford pupils the opportunity to apply that learning. However, as Education Scotland has said, they have reported that following 109 nutritional inspections of secondary schools, some 70% of school meals failed to meet nutritional standards. Platitudes will not solve this problem. We need to create an environment where the learning that pupils receive in schools can be applied in the real world. If it were left to pupils, I would suggest that, that to deliver their learning, uh, the learning they receive, I'm pretty sure that the system they come up, with, come up with would not look much like the current one. I have to say, as for the Labour uh, amendment, apart from the regurgitating of the issues that there is a higher prevalence of fast food, alcohol and tobacco outlets in the more deprived areas, which is one of the main reasons we're having this debate, there is little substance to it. In fact, I think it's, one, it's the usual one-dimensional approach. I would ask them, when you drive past any fast food outlet near a school at lunchtime and there are huge queues of school pupils, is that the result of a lack of money or austerity? Is the fact that so many pupils who are eligible for a school meal yet still, still choose to join the fast food queues mm -hmm. an austerity issue? Laban, I have to say you've chosen to avoid the issue in favour of plumbing a tired political line in search of some kind of revelance. Uh, revelant. And frankly, I will take an intervention. Alison Johnson. Mr Whittle must surely understand that young people want to spend time with other young people, that if their friends are going out for lunch, they may wish to join them. Surely the best that we could do is make sure everyone has enough of an income so that they're not stigmatised. Some young people find stigma in the fact that they are known to be having a free school meal. And that is part of this issue. Brian Whittle, I'll let you make up your I time. Flip, can I, I can flip that, that on its head? In fact, when we have when free school meals, most people don't know who it is that are getting free school meals because they, they have a card to, to, to get the school meal. And what we should be doing is encouraging more school children to stay in school to get a healthy meal and they wouldn't have to go. What we, actually, what we actually have to do is understand what drives that kind of behavioural pattern. It's an obvious first step. And key to that to be ensured that the food on the plates in schools are of the highest quality, preferably sourced by local farmers. 
Giving pupils input into menu choice is part of that education. We'll afford that buy-in so more pupils will stay in school. Planning has, to be part, has a part to play, as, 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 uh, as I think is trying to be indicated in the labour movement. We need to stop food vans from camping outside schools and be more selective in what outlets are granted licences near schools. Mm -hmm. How else are pupils going to be dissuaded from rejecting school meals in favour of fast food? It's not rocket science. It just needs the courage and the will to act. And we all know that a healthy diet is one of the cornerstones of health and well-being, along with physical activity and inclusivity. And, and, and much debated in this chamber, issues such as mental health and eating disorders and preventable cancers, diabetes, educational attainment, preventable health agenda, musculoskeletal conditions and obesity, all should have nutrition as a key component in that policy. And I have yet to hear a minister even mention nutrition as part of a solution in any of the plethora of ministerial statements that we've been recently bombarded with. If I, take a, if I take an example, it's very clear from research uh, the part that basic healthy diet has to play in, in impacting in mental health. In the Mental Health, health Foundation's presentation, Food for Thought, they state one of the most obvious yet unrecognised factors in developing of mental health is nutrition. They go on to say there's a growing body of evidence indicating that nutrition may play an important role in the prevention, development and manage of diagnosed mental health problems such as depression anxiety, schizophrenia, attention de deficit hyperactivity disorder and dementia. I would say that getting it right from day one has to be the goal. It's much easier to influence at the early age than to try and change behaviours later in life. Much of the health and education pathways are already set by the time children reach school age. So the importance of early good practice cannot be overstated. Education is a crucial background, so not just tackling the obvious attainment goals, but also for better health outcomes. I think Sir Harry Burns uh, stated that the way in which we nurture children, the way in which we bring children into the world, and the way in which we look after them in the first years of life is absolutely critical uh, to the creation of physical, mental and social health. So I think what we have to do, Deputy Presiding, is, is understand, and, 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 I say it's little use uh, to understand what programmes need to be delivered if there's not a delivery mechanism. It will be our healthcare professionals, our teachers and the third sector whom we will turn to, and the evidence is there to tell us that they are given adequate support the space for creativity and innovation uh, will develop. So listen, I'm sorry, I've only got one minute left. Presiding officer, this debate, uh, for this debate, we could have had, in my opinion, should have had uh, the cabinet secretaries for health, education and the rural economy sitting in the government benches speaking to this motion. Not to have them put forward for this debate, for this debate for me highlights the continuing lack of understanding of the complexities of the issue from the Scottish government. Until they prepare to deliver a whole system cross portfolio approach, they will continue to make little progress in this policy area. Deputy Presiding Officer, we are talking about a significant system change, the benefit of which will, have, will take time to realise. So if, if, if implemented by the current Scottish Government, they will not get the credit. It will be subsequent administrations that take the plaudits. But as I have said uh, in my very first speech in this place, you can achieve anything as long as you don't mind who gets the credit. More than that, at any other time, Deputy Presiding Officer, this place has the capability of meaningfully affecting Scotland's long-term rising health and education crisis. Nutrition is a key pillar of good health and education, which therefore tackles the much-discussed health inequalities and attainment. The solutions lie entirely within the competency of this Parliament. It's time the Scottish Government grasped the nettle, stopped the endless pontificating and tinkering around the edges and delivered effective change. Can you please move your motion? Mr Whittle. I, I move the motion. Thank you very much. I now call on Joe Fitzpatrick to speak to move Amendment 16710.2. Minister, six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm going to start by thanking Brian Whittle for giving us the opportunity to debate this important subject. I wanted to then go on and, and say just how heartened I'd been that in general, when we've had these debate, debates, we've managed to debate them in a cross-party way, um, and, and I had hoped that that would be the case today. I hope that is the case for the rest of today's debate, because I, I was di genuinely disappointed by the tone uh, of, of Brian Whittle's uh, contribution, because it's not where we've been when we've been discussing this very important matter in the past, and I hope we can get back to working together across this chamber on an issue which is very, very important. And I do think we genuinely share um, my ambition and our ambition is for a Scotland where we eat well and have a healthy weight and are physically act active. And I'm sure that's something that we all, we all share. Eating well in childhood impacts on the quality of our later lives. Last year, 
we published a comprehensive delivery plan with a strong emphasis on the early years. If we can't get it right then, if we can get it right then, we can prevent ill health in the first place. The scale of the problem we face is significant. 26% of children in Scotland are at risk of being overweight or obese, and half of those um, at risk of obesity specifically. A baby born to an obese mum is more likely to become obese in childhood and remain so as an adult. These are stark facts. We in government are taking a joined up approach right across government to drive the improvements we need. To focus minds we've set ambitious targets, halving childhood obesity by 2030 and significantly reducing diet related health inequalities. But government can't solve this alone. We must and will provide leadership, but this is a shared responsibility. Citizens, business, the NHS, lo local government and the third, se third sector must work across society. We want to make it easier for everyone to make healthier choices. Personal responsibility is important, but making good decisions is tough and we are, when we're constantly bombarded with messages encouraging us to impulse buy and overconsume junk food. I'm pleased that we're making progress on this. So we've already consulted on proposals for restricting junk food promotions and Food Standards Scotland is working on proposals for improving food and drink out of home. And last year, um, and, and la later this year, we will explore whether planning policy could be used to improve the food environment. And I know that the areas around schools are of great concern to members across the chamber. I want to turn now to um, ensuring children in Scotland, no matter where they live, learn and play, eat well and have a healthy weight. Schools, nurseries and out-of-school care all play an important part. By August 2020, we'll increase the hours of funded early learning and childcare and ensure that children receive healthy meals and snacks as well as active play and learning. We've consulted on important changes to our school food regulations informed by the latest evidence and we'll publish the results of these later this month and soon we'll consult on our plans for out of school care ensuring alignment with the high standards of our school food. I want to acknowledge the importance of education. We want young people to leave school equipped to make good choices about their health and the food that they consume. Curriculum for Excellence provides uh, opportunities for learning about food and nutrition, but our plan recognises that parents and children have contact with many other professionals too. They too have a responsibility for promoting healthy eating, especially in those early years. At the outset, I, high, um, I highlighted our ambition to reduce diet-related uh, health inequalities. And many of the actions I've referred to will, be, will contribute to improvements, but we must also tackle the root causes. And we're determined that people have enough money to feed themselves and their family. Too many people in Scotland face food insecurity. That's why we continue to challenge the UK government's punitive welfare reforms, to continue to promote the living wage and continue to take a rights-based approach to design and delivery of Scotland's social security system. Through the good food, very, very quickly. Matt Ruskell. Way. Can, I, can I ask the Minister then, will you enshrine a right to food in the forthcoming Good Food Nation Bill? Joe Fitzpatrick. Through the Good Food Nation, we'll look at, at how we can give better effect to a rights-based approach in practice, as we've done with um, Social Security. For people, um, improving our diet and weight at any age can make a massive difference to our health and quality of life. For people with or at risk of type 2 diabetes, healthy weight is of particular importance. This disease can have a devastating impact on people's lives. This is largely uh, preventable, and yet we spend around 9% of the health budget treating it. So here too, we have ambitious plans, and we're investing £42 million over five years to help people make sustained changes to their diet and lifestyle. Finally, I want to acknowledge the importance of physical activity. Uh, last year, we published our delivery plan to support people in Scotland to be more physically active. Actions include more opportunities for young people to participate in sport before, during and after school. 
Presiding officer, it's vital that we all get behind this work to deliver what I hope is our shared ambitions to improve our food environment, making it easier for all of us to make healthier choices, to give children the best start in life and to help people become more active more often. Presiding officer, I move, I move the amendment in the name of the Deputy First Minister. I now call on David Stewart to speak to and move amendment 16710.1 for up to five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and could I congratulate the Conservative Group uh, for selecting health education as their topic uh, of debate this afternoon. And I agree with the bulk of the thrust of Brian Whittle's opening speech, which stressed the importance of nutrition, not least in the role of tackling the pandemic of obesity and type 2 diabetes. And I want to focus on the preventable health agenda, my remarks, and look at the bigger picture the role that austerity and health inequality plays in Scottish health education. Beside officer last year, I was invited to visit young people at Charleston Academy in Inverness to talk about diabetes as joint chair of the cross party group. The class I spoke to had an in-home app that could read barcodes of supermarket products and translate the composition of food into amounts of sugar that it contained. And as an experiment, they scanned a large, box of, a large box of Jaffa cakes. Uh, it contained 32 lumps of sugar, a major contributor, of course, to the development of type 2 diabetes. And as we've heard uh, from the minister and other speakers earlier, being classed as obese uh, or overweight is a significant contributing factor to developing type 2. Uh, and with our obesity crisis, it's unfortunately no surprise that figures in this condition make for bleak reading. Over 257,000 people in Scotland are diagnosed with type 2 and a further 500,000 are at risk of developing it. And as we all know in the chamber today, with a diagnosis of type 2 comes serious complications, the risk of blindness and the risk of amputation. And as the minister said earlier, almost a billion pounds is spent on the NHS on tackling diabetes, but 80% of this goes in managing avoidable complications. But I think when we're faced with the complexity of our obesity and our diabetes problems, it's easy to feel overwhelmed. Now, some of us, and Stuart Stevens is not in the chamber today, may longingly hark back to the good old days when food was less processed and children played outside rather than sitting playing football manager. Uh, but nostalgia is not a solution. The key is an approach which will not just negatively restrict unhealthy foods, but also make the option of a balanced diet much more practical. And we all know that the growth of out-of-home eating means that any strategy needs to be consistently strong approach when it comes to labelling and marketing of foods by restaurants and takeaways. However, this environmental shift needs to encompass much more than just our food culture. Although the nature of our public health challenge may look very modern, President Officer, under the surface, the root causes are the same old story. Poverty, social deprivation and inequality are significant contributors to being overweight and it's the least well-off who are most at risk. For example, a quarter of all children living in our most uh, deprived areas are at risk of obesity compared to only 17% in the least deprived. Now, I think this problem is captured very well by the Health and Sport Committee's report on health inequalities from 2015 when it stated, and I quote, a boy born today in Lindsay, East and Bartonshire can expect to live till he's 82. Yet for a boy born only eight miles away in Carlton, the east end of Glasgow, life expectancy may be as low as 54 years, a difference of 28 years, or almost half as long again as his whole life. So our in health inequalities are in fact just inequalities. They cannot be explained away purely as food choices that individuals make. So as food prices have risen, it's become harder for families in a tight budget to buy meals that are both filling and nutritious. And evidence shows, of course, that consumers want to buy healthier foods, but think it's more expensive. So regu uh, regulation of product promotions need to be more ambitious than merely reducing the number of unhealthy foods um, on offer. So placing restrictions on the formulation, sale and advertising of food products is beneficial, but it's also complex and tricky. So reversing our obesity crisis will require a cross-government commitment that is real realistic about the impact that poverty makes on individual health. So, President Officer, it's fine to talk about active travel, but what if it's not safe to walk or cycle in your local neighbourhood? It's fine to talk about healthy eating, 
But what if you cannot buy fresh fruit and veg from your local shops due to rising food prices? I'm sorry, my last minute. Just closing. It's fine to promote a balanced lifestyle, but what if you're on a minimum wage with a zero-hour contract and you need to grab fast food dinner during your split shift? To be serious about improving the health expectations of all our citizens means to be more determined to eradicate poverty in Scottish communities. And we need, as my party and the Scottish Corporate Party have argued, a right to food in a Good Food Nation bill. That's why Labour believe that tackling wealth inequalities is the heart of health and indeed all policy agenda. All we need to do is have the will to do and the soul to dare. And I move the amendment in my name. I call Mark Ruskell for up to four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I also welcome the debate today, and I'm sure there's much in the motion that the whole chamber will agree upon. Good nutrition and access to good nutrition should be at the core of our health, education and food systems. And I very much welcome the mention in the Labour Amendment of the right to food, because Greens have back, long backed the call to enshrine this right to food into Scots law. I very much look forward to the upcoming debates around the Good Food Nation legislation where we can make this a reality. This needs to be a priority of government minister and it needs to be a, a priority for multiple ministers in government from the cabinet secretary for rural to the environment um, to the entire cabinet. The right to food is not simply about delivering emergency food supplies. It's about enabling people to purchase, cook and enjoy high quality, healthy food no matter what their circumstances are in life. And I also welcome the recognition in the motion of the need for high quality local produce in early years settings and the fact that public procurement can be used to boost the local rural economy. This is something else the Greens have been pushing for in the Good Food Nation legislation with targets for local procurement and a full national rollout of the excellent Food for Life programme in all councils as a minimum. But this is also, presiding officer, where I have to take issue with the Conservative motion because their actions at local government level in Scotland do not stand up to these fine words. The Conservative-led Perth and Kinross Council, for example, earlier this year voted to close all of their school kitchens, putting 50 local staff out of a job and preparing meals centrally in a kitchen in Dundee before blast freezing and shipping to schools for reheating at a later date. Now, the last time I criticised this plan in this chamber, I was invited to taste test the school meals to see how much the pupils will enjoy them. And, and I don't doubt this. I enjoy chicken nuggets from time to time. But it doesn't mean I want my children eating them for lunch every single day. How do ready meals made in a central kitchen contribute to health and nutrition education in schools? How does it support local producers through public procurement or increase the amount of fresh fruit and vegetables our children are consuming? How does it encourage pupil choice in actually designing menus and the experience that they have in our schools. Now, one local councillor in Perth and Kinross described the plan as a job-killing proposal that puts the viability of a mega kitchen in Dundee above the needs of kids and our local hard-working catering staff. Presiding officer, if the Tory motion today means that the local councillors will be instructed to reverse these plans, and I'll be delighted to vote for it, but I fear this debate is hypocrisy from a party that puts financial savings over our children's health and well-being first. Um, I'm tight for time, so I will not be able to give away in this debate. Looking at the wider context of the debate, learning outdoors in a play-based environment is also a key part of an active, active lifestyle for our children. However, one in four Scots say the quality of their green space has declined in the last five years, and that council spending on parks and green space has reduced by a quarter in the last six years. The declining quality of Scotland's natural environment is taking away the rights of children to take part in outdoor activity and exercise. We also need to address the environment our kids grow up in, where they're so often surrounded by high-fat, high-sugar, ultra-processed foods. We need to consider a levy on multiple retailers and caterers who promote too much poor-quality food. And lastly, presiding officer, we cannot ignore the fact that child poverty and child health are inextricably linked. Families dependent on income support are likely to be the most in need of additional resources to ensure good nutrition. While we recognize the positive impact of schemes such as <coughs> Healthy Start, there are significant numbers of barriers to the scheme, such as eligibility and awareness of the process. Presiding officer, the Good Food Nation Bill must provide the foundation stone for a healthier nation, one that links producers with citizens with quality, healthier food. I look forward to the government finally bringing forward an ambitious bill to this parliament. 
Alex Cole Hamilton for up to four minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm also grateful to the Conservatives for securing time for this debate. It is an important debate. It's uh, uh, really important to the health of our nation. I'll come on to why. But I am slightly confused, and I'll just come out and say this. I do find it odd that the self-styled natural party of government that once boasted it was the most successful party in Western Europe should choose at this moment of national crisis that its topic for debate be recipe suggestions for five-year-olds. They can't hide away from and escape their disastrous Brexit policy, however much they try. I'm in my first minute. If I've got time, I will come back to you. One of the most visible Conservative spokespeople of the last couple of weeks, that MP Marc Francois, given that all moderates have now left, has been comparing Brexit to the Second World War. And so it is perhaps not a surprise that the Scottish Conservatives are extolling the wartime virtues of locally foraged food for school dinners and digging for victory, or if at least not victory, then apocalypse survival. My fear is that with trade barriers and tariffs, the Conservatives Conservatives may be raising a generation of children who have never get to see a tangerine or a banana until the rationing ends. I'll take an intervention now. Liz Smith. Has the member thought about what he has just said? Is there anything, is there anything more important than the young people of Scotland today? Thank you. Alex Cole Hamilton. I was thinking about them in every word that I said in that opening because there is nothing more of a threat to our, the young people in this country than the crisis that this Conservative government has plunged us into. But, presiding officer, I, dig I digress. Food matters. And whilst food matters, and whilst I may take exception to the timing of today's motion, I have no exception with its content. I remember with great interest as a member of the Health Committee. Uh, learning from a senior physician that, he, in his view, the six most important doctors are, in fact, sleep, exercise, sunlight, water, fresh air and vegetables. So, again, while I may pour scorn on the Conservatives, I do salute them for bringing this debate to the Chamber. It is important and it is uh, significant. The, imp the imperative for us to take nutrition and healthy living is acute. We know that £4.6 billion a year is spent on the cost of obesity in our hospitals. And it is responsible for 10.8% of caseload in the NHS. 300,000 people are diabetic in this country. And there is a socio-economic multiplier to this. In the Scottish indices of multiple deprivation, that those areas highest ranked in those tables have, are often the furthest away from fresh produce and lack the basic understanding of independent living skills to prepare healthy homemade and cheap meals uh, on a daily basis. So as such, I very much support the government's efforts in this regard around the Good Food Nation Bill and want to see that, like the rest of the chamber, underpinned by legislation. And the Trussell Trust uh, remark and point challenge us to, to look at that as the eradication initially of hunger, given that one in five households uh, in deprived areas have re frequently skipped meals or uh, prioritise other things than putting food on the table because of the nature uh, of their circumstance. Sustenance is a human right. I support the, the, the calls of the Scottish Food Coalition to see a statutory right to food, and I would like to uh, ask the Scottish Government to respond to that in terms of its remarks and where that fits in the legislative context. Food nu nutrition is vital. It's uh, vital in not just our societies, in our homes, but also in our caring environments as well. And I quite publicly raised an issue of a, about an ill-prepared hospital meal that was served to a friend's mother a few weeks ago. I want to thank the Cabinet Secretary for the action she took, because I recognise that was an exception, but it was important to give light to that problem. Uh, she's dealt with it well, and I hope that we see across our hospitals uh, a renaissance in food production and, and the quality therein. As I will finish now, Presiding Officer, yes, I do want to... Okay, I, I want to thank the Conservatives. I was perhaps being facetious at the top of my remarks, but this is an issue that should support the, Unite the Chamber. Thank you. Uh, we move to the open debate. Time is very, very tight, so please um, come in at under four minutes, please. John Scott, followed by Emma Harper. Well, thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I begin by declaring an interest as a farmer, a food producer, the founder of Farmers Markets in Ayrshire in the west of Scotland. Can I also welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate today on health education and presiding officer, for me this debate starts as far back as 1996 when Lord James Douglas Hamilton, still remembered with affection by some in this place from the years he spent here, and a minister in the Scottish office, first introduced the Scottish Diet Action Plan to improve the health of the people of Scotland. Ten years later the Scottish Diet Action Plan was reviewed in this parliament 
under the Labour Liberal Coalition by Professor Tim Lang, and the problems caused by poor diet and lifestyle choices had got worse. Then the Schools Health Promotion and Nutrition Scotland Bill was passed in this place in 2007, and I and others encouraged then Minister Andy Kerr to introduce a national procurement plan at that time so that only local Scottish food would be used in our schools, prisons and hospitals. But little happened, and Mark Ruskell probably was alluding to that. Cabinet Secretary uh, Richard Lockhead, around 2010-11, looked at this problem again, and the statistics had deteriorated still further. And here we are today, wringing our hands again, mm -hmm. asking what is to be done, yeah. as life expectancy has now started to reduce in Scotland, and today we confront the results of inertia for the last 12 years by the Scottish Government in this area of responsibility. That Scotland is the country with one of the poorest records on health in Europe should be a matter of shame for the SNP Government. And what this currently means is that children from deprived areas are almost twice as likely to become obese as children from more affluent backgrounds. Dietary goals have been missed for 20 years with only 15% of children eating five a day. And Scotland had, has one of the worst obesity records in OECD countries, with two-thirds of adults overweight, and still the government does nothing. Indeed, the Scottish government has only tinkered around the edges and made no real effort at all to improve public health in terms of diet in the 12 years they have been in office, and the problems continue to grow. So today, Scottish Conservatives suggest again, as a starting point, that only locally produced Scottish food should normally be available in our schools, hospitals and prisons. No, I'm sorry, I don't have time. Perhaps eight to ten years ago, East Ayrshire valiantly introduced this policy, recognising then the huge need for improved diet in East Ayrshire with the consequence of poor diet, namely poor physical and mental health, evident in what is now part of Jean Freeman's constituency. Buy local, eat local, as a strap line, was first used by me on our leaflet Scottish Conservatives distributed over 10 years ago, and it is still what needs to be done today. In addition, exercise is the new wonder drug, as I have again rediscovered for myself in later life, and physical activity should be a core part of children's lives from nursery school through to leaving school. Exercise improves both physical and mental health, and the lack of it in our children and young people is one of the keys to so many of the problems now being encountered by all age groups across Scotland. Exercise does not need to be overthought or be expensive, and it could be added to school curriculums at little or no cost. And I salute Elaine Wiley for creating the Daily Mile initiative. So, presiding officer, the problems we face today at their simplest could in large part be resolved by better diet preferably of food produced in Scotland, and more exercise. It's time to get our sleeves rolled up and get started for once on an uncomplicated agenda as all the evidence points to straightforward solutions. Thank you. Emma Harper, followed by Johan Lamont. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, I would like to thank Brian Whittle for bringing this uh, important motion to Chamber today and I'm pleased to speak this afternoon to reaffirm the need for people right across Scotland to have the means to live a healthy and active lifestyle, particularly by ensuring access to our country's finest and freshest produce. And I agree with what the motion uh, before us uh, states this afternoon. Indeed, since my election in 2016, I've been continually working on health and rural economy matters. So it's good to be able to link these two different aspects of policy together today. Presiding officer, a healthy and balanced diet needs, leads to a healthy life. And as a nurse and clinical educator with over 30 years experience caring for patients, and now as an MSP caring for and supporting constituents, I'm a huge proponent for social prescribing approaches to tackling and indeed preventing health issues such as obesity, type 2 diabetes, cancers and other diseases, as the motion states. And I support the Scottish Government's Healthy Weight Plan, which will aim to bring on existing projects which are in place across different parts of Scotland to ensure everyone can access them. And one project is the Daily Mile, as John Scott has just mentioned. We've spoken about the Daily Mile many times in Chamber previously, pioneered by Elaine Wiley, a Scottish head teacher in Stirling. And the Scottish Government, as well as local authorities, including the Friesland Galway Council in my South Scotland region, are now working to build the Daily Miles community with schools, sports bodies and other supporters. 
I participated in the Daily Mile when my sister's wains were at Echofecken Primary School. And I'm pleased that 57 out of the total of 63 schools, more than 90% across the Fries and Galloway, are signed up to the Daily Mile. And another social prescribing nutrition and weight loss initiative which I've been supporting is the Fixing Dad programme, which I've spoke about also in this chamber before. Fixing Dad involved Anthony and David Whittington and their family helping their dad, Jeff, lose over seven stone in weight, that's almost 45 kilos, by focusing on nutrition, cycling, and family support and encouragement. And I would encourage everyone to look at fixing dad, and I would welcome feedback from the Scottish Government about the merits and evidence from this. I'm pleased that we have a similar and already established group called Our Path, coming to present at the Diabetes Cross Party Group, which I co-convene with Dave Stewart and Brian Whittle. Presiding officer, decisive action needs to be taken to tackle the overall environment that makes it difficult to make the right food choices, the right nutrition choices for our kids. And I was pleased that the Scottish Government published the Healthier Future Scotland's Diet and Health Weight Delivery Plan in July last year, following wide consultation with stakeholders, which I also fed into. The plan has 67 actions and reiterated the ambition to have, ch have, childhood, ob uh, have childhood obesity in Scotland by 2030. It has also committed to significantly reduce diet-related health inequalities, as well as acting to restrict the promotion of junk foods. And the Scottish Government is investing an additional £42 million over five years to support weight management interventions for people with or at risk of type 2 diabetes all of which is extremely welcome. Presiding officer, while I don't have a lot of time left, I would like to highlight the importance of young people from both urban and rural areas knowing the provenance and sourcing of the food they're eating and also having access to fresh local produce. The Royal Highland Education Trust aims to provide the opportunity for every child in Scotland to learn about food, farming and the countryside. And it's achieved by farm visits to schools, classroom speakers, talks by volunteer farmers. And last week I attended the RET event at uh, the Wallace Martin Castle Douglas, which had 150 kids attending so they could see the provenance of the food that comes from Ferm to Fork. So, presiding officer, close, please. I encourage the Scottish Government to continue to look at social prescribing as well as value the importance of the Royal Highland Education Trust. Thank you. Johan Lamont, followed by Sandra White. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I'm happy to contribute to this issue of um, health eating and active lifestyle and the importance of, of health education um, for the well-being of Scots. Um, and I want in particular to focus on the issue of health eating. And despite um, the opening contribution from Brian um, uh, Whittle, I must say that most of what he suggests seems to me to be absolutely practical. Indeed, these are many things that have happened in the past. It doesn't feel terribly radical, and I'm quite surprised he has taken to be quite so aggressive to other uh, parties in this debate because I think he's suggesting something um, quite practical and sensible. But if we only said the practical and sensible things and didn't work out why people then didn't do them, we wouldn't be getting very far. And I have to say to the Tories, these issues cannot be seen in a vacuum. Tory economic and welfare policy have a great deal to answer for in impoverishing people, creating uncertainty as a daily reality for all too many people and bringing about greater inequality across our communities. And we should be aware too of the consequence of a UK government economic strategy, which is based all too often on employment without job security, with flexibility that prevents people applying their lives, um, and with at its core an insecurity which in itself is a significant factor in creating ill health. And if anyone has ever watched a delivery person arriving with a parcel at their door and running to the next place and the next place and the next place, they must know the impact that that is having on people's lives. And I would also say to the Scottish Government, if the Scottish Government is to be seen as serious in tackling inequality, it really must reassess its choice to target local councils for disproportionate cuts, given the potential role for local services, and particularly schools around health education, or for fitness projects, for health eating projects, and support for families who need a bit of help in order to address these questions. We have lost so much of that already, and I think because there has not been an honest conversation in government about why local government budgets need to be protected. 
But in my short contribution, I want to highlight the campaign by the Scottish Cooperative Party and the Cooperative Party across the United Kingdom. And I should declare an interest as a Labour and Cooperative MSP in the campaign for food justice, tackling food poverty locally and campaigning for a more strategic approach nationally. This campaign brings together the practicalities that Brian Whittle talks about, but also the importance of understanding it in context. Figures tell us 8 million people across the United Kingdom are having trouble putting food on the table and are, quote, food insecure. We know this is a problem for all too many families in Scotland too. And it's why we're calling on the Scottish Government to bring forward in the Good Food Nation Bill um, a right to food to be incorporated in the bill. And this is a point that's been highlighted by other speakers and I hope that the Minister will respond to that. We know from Cooperative Party Research that there have been over 150,000 cases of crisis grants issued by the Scottish Welfare Fund in the last available year statistics, which at least at part uh, refer to the need for food. And we also know about food banks. Now, I've been privileged to see firsthand the work of Glasgow South West and South East food banks, run with dignity, with compassion, and meeting real need, not just for food, but for the support, the advice, the perhaps a bit of companionship that supports people in very challenging times. The indignity of having to go to food banks, I know, is addressed by those who run them, who try to make it as dignified an experience as possible. But we also all know we don't want these food banks to exist, and the volunteers themselves don't want you them to exist. But while, close, they do, please. while they do, I would urge the government to ensure that they're properly funded. I just urge government at every level to come together to address the whole question of food um, and healthy you lifestyle, must close, please. not just for education, but across responsibilities of government. Sandra White, followed by Peter Chapman. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President Officer, and I want to thank Brian Whittle for securing this debate. I think it is really important that uh, people, young and old, actually, are educated on uh, healthy living and healthy eating as well. I want to concentrate on local issues, uh, local initiatives in my particular area. Joanne Lament mentioned uh, areas in her area, and I think it's from local it grows. It's not just in schools, it's in other areas, and you'll pardon the pun when I say grows uh, in, that, in that respect. So I want to mention some of the charitable organisations that have, in my area, have improved basically the lives of so many people in the area. Uh, the Woodlands Community Trust, uh, lasting benefits for the area, people who live, work and study in the Kelvin constituency, helps local residents, businesses also contribute uh, to the economic improvement of woodland areas and it promotes the health and well-being of local people. It does learning and education within the community and within the woodlands also. And a number of the projects they have is the Woodlands Community Cafe. Each year, 50 households grow their own fruit, vegetables, herbs in the gardens, raise beds, and dozens of local people maintain and improve the gardens through twice weekly garden volunteering as well. It's open to visitors. You don't have to have a raised bed in order to volunteer. Uh, they also have the Woodlands Community Cafe, which opened in 2014. And since, since then, it's provided a space where 70 to 80 local people meet on a Monday evening, and they share a healthy, home-cooked meal and get to know others which is in their community. Uh, the cafe is run on a pay-as-you-can basis. It's free for people who are on low incomes. It's been fantastically successful in helping to reduce isolations in that particular area, Woodlands in my constituency, and it also supports people who go through difficult times. New visitors receive a very warm welcome and uh, they enjoy the cookery and the well-being of the workshops throughout the year. And the food that's vegetarian is also tasty and nutritious and it's grown in their own community garden and I think that's fantastic and they also run cookery workshops from there also. The Children's Wood in North Kelvin Meadows, a community-led organisation, provides safe open spaces for children and members of the local community to access. Nursery schools there, primary schools also go there. They're able to access the meadows, they have storytelling, they have exercises, healthy eating activities. It's really fantastic and apart from the fact that it's healthy eating and educational, being outside, and this is really important, I think, being outside in the fresh air, even if it's just to play, do whatever, it can reduce anxiety, 
increased self-esteem, uh, within children, attention span, I think, which uh, Brian Whittle had also mentioned, and adults also benefit from it as well. One of the ones we've been ongoing for a long time is Annex Healthy Living Centre. Uh, it's worked with the local community in the Glasgow party area, delivers wellbeing initiatives, Healthy Living Centre base uh, in 2018. And I think Joanne Lamont did mention the fact about you know, receiving money from NHS and local uh, you know, government as well. Uh, basically, they entered into a community health and care partnership and they delivered healthy eating initiatives in four neighbourhoods across the west of Glasgow. And during this time, they worked very closely to make sure that the residents were able to access programmes which met their needs of eating uh, also as well. And they built up support in these particular areas. And they also got additional funding from Glasgow Community Planning, which is from Glasgow City Council. And they deliver weekly health clubs across central Glasgow, nutrition and health eating courses, and they promote healthy living as well. And one of the new kids on the block is G3 Growers. It's a community garden. Uh, it's in Beacon Street, which is in between a couple of tenements. It used to be a dumping site at one particular point, but now it has five large raised beds. It's got two greenhouses, a tool shed, and a mini orchard as well. Orchard as well. And it grows and shares all of its produce collectively with members, holds open days, Must growing close, sessions. Please. Uh, so I think that's the way forward. If it, just a very last minute, mm, we should be no. looking at the health benefits close, of water. <laughs> uh, Peter Chapman, followed by George Adam. Could you aim for three and a half minutes, please? Thank you, Deputy President Officer. And I must register an interest as a partner in a farming business. And having spent my whole life growing up on and then working on my farm, producing high quality crops and meat and being active all day, I appreciate the necessity for a healthy diet and a healthy fit body. Eating good healthy food was my fuel for long days on the farm. However, since becoming an MSP and sitting in an office three days a week, I've seen firsthand how a change in lifestyle can affect weight. A fly cup and a fancy piece each afternoon is still appealing, but now I have to make the choice not to. And that's what this debate is all about, choices, and teaching our future generations to make the right choices with their diet, their exercise regime, and ultimately their weight. People must take responsibility for their own health choices. We have a crisis in Scotland with 65% of the population classed as overweight and 29% of these obese. And obesity is leading to a type 2 diabetes crisis, which is hitting hard and costing our NHS huge and increasing amounts of money. And this is so disappointing in a country with such a rich history of quality food. Our farmers work tirelessly to produce the best food produced to the highest standards. Our fishermen brave dangerous seas to bring us a variety of fresh, wholesome fish. And our biggest food export is salmon. Presiding officer, we have some of the highest animal welfare standards in the world and some of the best farmers. Good local food is abundantly available. And it should be obvious that we should shop locally and eat healthily and fresh local produce should take precedence over imports in food procurement for our schools, hospitals and prisons. Now, I was impressed to see the development Aberdeenshire Council have made for the provision of school meals and the engagement that parents can have with their kids about what they eat and why. Aberdeenshire Council uses an online payment system, enabling parents to top up their kids' account whilst also seeing an online menu for the week ahead. This allows parents to sit down and talk to their child about what option to pick that day. And this is a great opportunity for both parent and child to consider healthier choices. Aberdeenshire Council School Catering Service currently holds the Soil Association Bronze Food for Life Catering Award. And this means meals contain no undesirable food additives or hydrogenated fats. 75% of dishes are freshly prepared. Meat is from farms which satisfy UK welfare standards. Eggs are from cage-free hens. Minus Menus are seasonal and training is provided for all catering staff. Now that's all good. However, there are still improvements to be made. FOI figures last year showed that Scotland Excel, the shared national procurement service, spends just 16% of its budget for school food on food sourced in Scotland. Now that's a shocking figure which must improve quickly. Why on earth are we importing chicken from Thailand 
to feed our school kids. In Aberdeenshire, this is slightly higher, with 26% of its spend on food originating in Scotland. But it still has a long way to go. I appreciate what, appreciate what has been said across the chamber today. We need to educate our youth about an active and healthy lifestyle. And this educating, education can come in many forms, through PE lessons, cooking lessons, hearty school meals, using local produce, and most importantly, children learning that good, healthy, home-produced food come to close, is good please. for them, both physically and mentally. Thank you. George Adam, no more than three and a half minutes, please. The Thank last you. speaker in the open debate. Thank you, President Officer. I am pleased to speak in this debate, and this is a very important issue and one we must all come together to tackle. Frequently, we are divided in this chamber, especially right now during these difficult times, but I think we can all agree that health and happiness of our children, and for some of us, our grandchildren, must be a primary concern. Obesity is a serious public health issue that cannot be ignored, but Scotland's vision is simple, to be part of a country where everyone eats well and we are all a healthy weight. But it is my belief, presiding officer, that many young people are currently aware of the need for healthy eating and the choices that they have. It's a work in progress, but it's so much better than when I was younger and when my own children were younger as well. But it's something that we must show leadership and continue with as well. And as is always the case, presiding officer, I'll bring up what is happening in my constituency. There are many examples of education programmes in Paisley that have been uh, successful. One in particular was one that Remshire Council did, which promoted healthy choices and healthy, affordable eating for families, where the fact that they offered, they showed the, the families the options that they had to buy uh, affordable, uh, healthy food. And it was really quite good because it led, in many cases, to families actually sitting down at the table and having dinner with one another, which they never had done beforehand. There's also a programme which I've brought up before, which the Modern FC have included uh, training fathers from various backgrounds and creating and cooking, cooking a healthy dinner for families, uh, for their families uh, at the St. Martin Corporate Hospitality uh, Unit. And really, that's an example of you could do that programme elsewhere, but you're more likely to get that core group doing it at the football club and get them to actually do it there. So the children would go out and play uh, five-a-side football and dad would learn to cook a healthy meal and they'd all sit down and have that meal. But schools in Remshire are also getting on with this, uh, with healthy, healthy school meals. People have their say in Hearty Life School Menu Initiative in Renfrewshire, and young people are having their say on the food on their plates by helping develop healthier high school menus. And healthy food choices are now more prominently displayed at serving areas, with catering staff encouraged to nudge pupils to make healthier choices. And young health ambassadors were responsible for finding out the nutritional facts of different foods and then for creating nutritional themed displays uh, within the canteen which make the fellow pupils aware of the health benefits of the food in front of them. And similar work has been carried out in all the high schools in Renfrewshire and been offered in some of the kitchens, so much so that Renfrewshire Council is also working in partnership with West College Scotland to deliver a bespoke cooking skills training course open to all catering staff and designed around the school menu. As a nation, presiding officer, we consume too much, uh, too much food and drink that has little or no nutritional benefit but which contributes high calories or salt to our diet. And we're inundated with tempted every day by junk food promotions and the marketing of unhealthy food, such as multi-bias to encourage overconsumption. This can lead to diabetes, heart disease, certain types of cancer and other illnesses, putting immense pressure on our NHS and our vital public services and on our economy. But moving forward, presiding officer, we must all do what we can to ensure that our children's health and they have accessible to food remains at the top of our agenda. And it's important for all of us to get together, particularly those of us that are of a certain age and should know better. We move to the closing speeches. Uh, David Stewart, up to four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. I think this has been a, an excellent debate with well-argued and informative speeches from across the chamber. The Labour amendment emphasised the bigger picture issues such as the role health inequality and austerity play in creating uh, food insecurity. And I should at this point have declared my membership of the Scottish Co-op Party for Sound Officer. The key element in this debate echoed by a succession of speakers is that nutrition plays a crucial role in fighting head-on 
the growing cost of the preventable health agenda, such as obesity, type 2 diabetes, and many types of cancer. As was raised by many MSPs in this debate, such as uh, the Minister, Joe Fitzpatrick, Mark Ruskell, Alec Cole Hamilton, John Scott, Emma Harper, uh, Joanne Laman, and George Adam, over a quarter of adults in Scotland are obese. This increases the risk of individuals developing many potentially serious health conditions. And of course, we all know that the risk of obesity varies across Scotland, where we've seen 21% of women living in affluent areas compared with 37% uh, of those in disadvantaged areas. I thought it was a number of excellent points in the debate, though I didn't agree with all of Brian Fittle's earlier comments, and he did make some sense on the locally sourced food. He made an interesting point that 70% of school meals failed nutrition standards. And of course, a very important point, there's a link between nutrition and the management of mental health. And the minister, I've made a point I would agree with, um, about the importance of seeing Scotland as a place where we eat well and have healthy weight, and the role in prevention of ill health, and of course how we need to have a joined up approach uh, with informed, healthier choices. Uh, Mark Ruskell, I think, made a very strong point about the right to food, something I echoed in my own statement, uh, through the Good Food Nation Act. Uh, a worrying problem about the decline in green spaces and the very important link between child poverty uh, and child health. Um, Alec Cole Hamilton um, adopted a Chicharlian role, if I can pronounce it, in talking about digging for victory, uh, about the costs of obesity, uh, and made some very important points about uh, uh, we need to develop independent living, in, particularly in our schools. Uh, jo John Scott, um, as a very experienced farmer, made some very good points about his earlier campaign uh, about uh, buy local um, and uh, source locally, which is a, a point I would strongly agree about, and how the magic pill that we have is, of course, exercise, one we should be using uh, a lot more. And I wasn't aware of the earlier Scottish uh, diet plan, uh, something I think was uh, extremely uh, important to emphasise. Um, Emma Harper, I think, made some excellent points. I would particularly um, share her point about the Fixing Dad presentation, which I was also at the meeting, which is, for those that haven't followed, is effectively a way of not quite curing, but perhaps reducing type 2 diabetes, the very important role um, of social prescribing, uh, and vitally important to have a balanced diet. My colleague, uh, Joanne Lamont, made excellent points about healthy eating and how we can all talk about the practical and the sensible. The difficulty is how we enact it on the grounds and of course echoed the point about the impacts of the UK economic policy and again stressed the importance um, of the Scottish Court, the campaign um, for uh, food justice. In the few seconds remaining, uh, uh, presiding officer, uh, my belief is that health inequality is at the root of this debate and that poverty, social deprivation and social inequalities are significant contributors to being overweight and it's the least well off who are most at risk. The key for me is why should your postcode determine your life expectancy and why should the right to food not be a basic human right? And to conclude, as Martin Luther King has said, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and the most inhumane. Thank you. John Swiddy, for up to five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, I welcome this opportunity to close this debate on behalf of the government and to confirm to Brian Whittle, if he hadn't noticed, that there were in fact two education ministers on the front bench and two health ministers on the front bench for the entirety of this debate. I accept the government's role, the significant role of the government in taking forward the debate on health education. And that's why the issues around uh, health and nutrition are central to the broad general education uh, as part of Curriculum for Excellence. They're rec recognising the importance of young people being, having the access to at every stage of their learning opportunities from the early level that commences with an early learning childcare right through their school education to have uh, an understanding of the relationship between food and health and the importance of making uh, positive dietary choices and positive choices about their own well-being as part of uh, their, uh, th 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 their own decisions about their lives and as part of their education. There is, of course, an extra dimension to this, which is the role of wider players within our society, in particular our communities. And I want to commend my colleague Sandra White on a, a beautiful speech that set out the work of the Woodlands Community Trust, which was a very vivid example of what community organisations can do to marshal uh, a spirit of goodwill 
and very constructive activity at local level to make a profound difference in the, the benefits that Sandra White cited of social interaction, of the role of the community garden, of the health and the exercise regimes associated with all of that was, I thought, a very powerful illustration of the fact that there are players within our society out with government who can contribute significantly to this debate, and I welcome that. I thought Joanne Lamont made a very fair point in her uh, contribution about the fact that the Conservative arguments in this debate had essentially glided past the social and economic impact of austerity and the choices that that uh, in inflicts upon individuals uh, were vividly illustrated by um, Joanne Lamont and no doubt about to be answered by Brian Whittle. Brian Whittle. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary uh, uh, for allowing this intervention? I think my, my whole point is, is that in all of this, the education system is a system that we have a great, a great amount of impact in, and that's the place we, sh we should be focusing the biggest intervention on, in the ability to, 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 for, for food and, 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 and for going on. So that's the point I was trying to make. And that's, and, that's, and that's where I started my speech and accepted that responsibility with the centrality of curriculum for excellence. But if we're going to have a complete debate about these issues, we have to reflect on the fact that there are wider implications of people's lives, most of which come from the austerity agenda that Mr Whittle spectacularly ignored in all of his contribution to Parliament today. Now, uh, John, Scott, John Scott normally makes... Uh, Excuse some... me, Mr Swinney. Could we stop with the private arguments, please? Take them outside if you wish. Mr Swinney. Uh, President Officer... Uh, John Scott normally makes um, well-informed contributions to the debates in Parliament, but I felt he was pretty wide of the mark today. Um, Mr Scott uh, seemed to ignore, in his attack on the fact that uh, young people are not as active as they should be, he ignored the fact that the percentage of school pupils meeting the commitment to two hours or two periods of PE per week has risen from 10% in 2004 5 to 99% in 2018. He also managed to ignore the fact that almost 70% of children participate in sport each week, which is a very encouraging level of participation. So I, I simply say, I cite these points to essentially put a bit more balance into the debate. It, of course I will do, yes. John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In that case, why then are, is obesity a growing crisis? Why then is it the fact that many young people will die before their parents because of type 2 diabetes. That's also an acknowledged fact. So what's, what's, what's the answer? Because exercise is certainly part of the answer, Mr Swinney. John Swinney. Well, part, part, part of the answer is having a complete debate about these issues. And I'm simply citing that there's good evidence to show that there's good active participation in sport within Scotland. And we should celebrate that. And there's good active participation in our schools. And we should celebrate that, which we didn't hear from the Conservatives in the debate this, uh, this afternoon in, in, in Parliament today. So there's a whole host of things come together. The way in which the government's expanding early learning and childcare, the way in which we entrench um, the ideas are, and issues around food education within Curriculum for Excellence are all central to ensuring that we support the uh, taking forward of a healthy diet and a healthy exercise regime by young people in Scotland. And let me close with just one other statistic, presiding officer, which is to say that in the last 10 years, there's been a 41% increase in the Scottish products um, being included in school contracts for school meals, a 41% increase in that level of participation, which is a good start by the Scottish Government. We want to go further, we want to encourage more, and that is exactly what the Government is going to do in its forward agenda. I call Liz Smith to wind up the debate. Six minutes will take us to decision time, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I begin my remarks with reference to uh, Countryside Learning Conference, which took place uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I had the privilege uh, to speak at that. And uh, one of the interesting groups there, Sandra White, was the Woodland Communities Trust, and I pay tribute to what they were uh, doing. Now, that conference uh, was primarily about what we have to do to increase collaboration across all the groups that are involved in outdoor learning. But a great deal of that focus on that day was about the well-being of our young people and how the rural communities are so crucial in that respect. And I, I was struck very much, apart from all the educational opportunities that we were debating, that food and nutrition were the recurring themes for the whole conference. And that is something that I think is just so important. Indeed, Mr Alex Cole-Hamilton, that is exactly the reason why we picked up 
this topic for that debate because that is so important when it comes to what we're doing. I'm glad to hear people like George Adam uh, supporting that as well. Now, several speakers have obviously talked about a lot of different local initiatives, but I want to emphasise uh, my remarks on involving young people in the decision making. In the 2007-11 Parliament, the then Education Committee spent a huge amount of time looking at the issue of free school meals. And apart from the committee uh, taking its own evidence, it looked at the evidence that had been presented elsewhere, including from many of the deprived communities. And that included uh, a project in Hull, which was cited as a, a project that had had a very significant involvement of young people in making the decisions. And that included, when it came to uh, the school menus, uh, pupils, parents and teachers were all involved in the creation of these menus and giving given opportunities to participate in making and serving some of the food. That Eat Well, Do Well uh, project also had a lot of lessons about raising attainment, about behaviour, about concentration, and I think there's a lot to be said uh, for initiatives uh, that do just that. Now, my colleague uh, Brian Whittle referred in his remarks to the Mental Health Foundation's assertion that one of the most obvious yet under-recognised factors in the development of mental health is nutrition, and I agree with that. And there's a growing body of evidence which indicates that nut nutrition plays a really key role in the prevention of mental health problems, and that is surely an important message in an age where the concerns over mental well-being have such prominence, and rightly so. And of course, we know from our own evidence in this place that the earliest years are absolutely vital, and the Cabinet Secretary, in fact, Minister Tu is absolutely correct in saying that these should be the focus of our attention. Because these are ages before children would be in a position to know what is good for them. And as the Minister rightly said in his contribution, it is the education of parents and of all those who are caring for our youngest children uh, that matters so much, whether that's in nurseries uh, or across childcare and uh, health visitors, because uh, their input to this uh, could hardly be more important. Now, several speakers have flagged up the Scottish Government's own Scottish Health Survey released in September last year, which showed the deeply worrying statistics. And I'm not going to rehearse uh, the numbers that members have spoken about. But I do find it particularly worrying that as few as 15% of young people are getting their recommended five portions of fruit and vegetables a day, and that the recent statistics from Food Standards Scotland are showing that Scots are still eating as much sugar as they were eight years ago. These statistics could hardly be more damning. And it shouldn't just be all about cost. I think uh, David Stewart made an important uh, point about that. I would challenge anybody to say that healthy food has to be expensive. It doesn't. Uh, but we need to change the culture and educate people to understand that and to take advantage of the absolute richness of Scotland's uh, local produce. And that's in an age where, obviously, the uh, buying of convenience foods is perhaps increasingly easy. So I don't doubt the extent of that challenge, but uh, we have a big job to, to do to ensure that we can eat healthily and inexpensively. Now, the Scottish Conservative Healthy uh, Lifestyle Strategy, which was released last year, concentrated uh, very much on this cross-portfolio approach. And while I recognise that there have been ministers in the chamber from different uh, portfolios, it's the joining together and collaboration, which I think many members in this chamber have spoken about. And it's that overall strategy that we need to concentrate on. And I don't think there's a party political divide there, but I think it is something that we very much need to focus on. Now, can I bring my uh, remarks to a close in the last minute about some of the issues that we have uh, taken on board at the cross-party group on sport? because sport and physical fitness is all part of this uh, same uh, issue. It has been put to us by many of the evidence sessions that we have had on the cross-party group that the availability of sports facilities is, is something that we have to uh, look at, which is why uh, in this party we've been recommending a comprehensive analysis of, why, of when school facilities are available and whether we can make better use of these facilities at weekends and during holiday times. And I hope it's not too late for the Scottish Government to consider what the possible impact might be of all of this, given some of the recommendations within the Barclay report. There's also been much debate about the access, particularly for our young children, to a PE specialist, particularly in an age where teacher shortages 
have been exposed to the full because these PE specialists can have a huge influence on our young people and on their activity and physical exercise. But a third thing that has come to that cross-party group is the need to make our leisure centres much more family friendly, both in terms of the experience of being in that leisure centre and in terms of the charges for entry. I see my time is up, uh, presiding officer. Nobody is saying that these uh, answers are easy, but I do think it's very important to have this debate to ensure that we are not frightened to bring up some of the issues that may be the most challenging uh, so that we can work collaboratively to deal with them. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on health education. We're going to move on to the next item of business, which is a consideration of business motion 16733 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau setting out a business programme. Could I call on Graham Day to move the motion? Move, presiding officer. Thank you very much. And no one is asked to speak against the motion. The question, therefore, is that motion 16733 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item is consideration of six parliamentary bureau motions. Could I ask Graham Day on behalf of the bureau to move motions 16734 and 16735 on deadlines for lodging questions, 16736 on designation of a lead committee, and 16737 to 16739 on approval of SSIs? Moved, presiding officer. Thank you very much. We turn now to decision time. The first question this evening is that amendment 16702.3 in the name of Jean Freeman, which seeks to amend motion 16702 in the name of Miles Briggs on looking after those who look after us be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 16702.3 in the name of Jean Freeman is yes 58, no 52. There were six abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is the amendment 16702.1 in the name of Monica Lennon, which seeks to amend motion 16702 in the name of Miles Briggs on uh, looking after those who look after us be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that motion 16702 in the name of Miles Briggs as amended be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 16702 in the name of Miles Briggs as amended is yes 87, no 28. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. The next question is that amendment 16710.2 in the name of John Swinney, which seeks to amend motion 16710 in the name of Brian Whittle on health education be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. <laughs>
Although someone suggested they may have voted no, they didn't. It was unanimous. And the, the, vote, the amendment is agreed. OK, well, the, <laughs> the result of the vote on amendment number 16710.2 in the name of John Swinney is yes, 115. There were no votes against, so there are no abstentions. It has been agreed. The next question is that amendment 16710.1 in the name of David Stewart, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Brian Whittle, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. Right, we're not agreed this time. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. Thank you. The result of the vote on amendment number 16710.1 in the name of David Stewart is yes, 31, no, 85. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that motion 16710 in the name of Brian Whittle as amended on health education be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Now I propose to ask a single question on six parliamentary bureau motions. Does any member object? No one objects. The question is that motions 16734 to 16739 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Now that concludes decision time, but before uh, we move to members' business, uh, I wanted to let members know about Parliament's plans to meet over the recess. Uh, the Parliamentary Bureau has been uh, considering this uh, matter in the last few days and considering Parliament's response in the event of the United Kingdom leaving the European Union on Friday the 12th of April without a negotiated deal. I can confirm that my intention is to recall Parliament next week to meet at 1pm on Thursday the 11th of April in the circumstances that the UK is due to leave the EU without a deal on the following day. I indicated last week that I would try and give members at least two days notice of the decision whether or not to recall. Now, this is clearly an ongoing developing situation, and I may therefore not be in a position to confirm a recall to members until after decisions are taken at the EU summit on Wednesday the 10th of April. The decision to recall or not will be communicated to you through the Parliament's alert system, and of course your business managers will keep you updated. The parliamentary business team is also happy to advise members throughout the week. Thank you very much. And on that note, we will now move to members' business.